In this tutorial, I'm going to show you an internal load balancer that's going to balance the public HTTP and FTP ports between two virtual machines that are part of the same subnet. If you look here to the left, you can see here's the load balancer, or an icon representing the load balancer, and here are the two VMs it's going to load balance. One's named MyVM1, the other's named MyVM0. Over here on the right, you can see the resources that are all part of this particular deployment. There's an availability set, which makes sure that the two VMs don't go down at the same time. There's the load balancer I'm going to show you. There are two network interfaces, one for each VM. There's a public IP address through which I'm able to access these VMs, both by IP address and by domain name. There's a virtual network, the subnet against which these machines are inside. And there's a storage account, of course, so that I can store the VHDs. If I come over here and click on the icon for the load balancer, I can see on the left hand side its properties and settings. And I want to focus on a few things the front end IP pool, the back end pools, health probes, load balancing rules, and inbound NAT rules. These are the things we're going to be focusing on during this demo. The front end IP pool in this case represents everything external to this subnet that's going to be accepted by the load balancer. In other words, all the incoming traffic comes in through the front end IP pool. Because this is a public facing subnet, it has it's going to accept internet traffic. In this case, the front end IP pool for this particular subnet and this particular load balancer, as you can see, is the public IP address I assigned to this subnet. If I look at the back end pools, the back end pools are going to be the IP addresses of the two virtual machines that are part of my subnet. In this case, you can see one's at 10.0.0.5, the other's at 10.0.0.4. And again, these are my two VMs, and they're attached through a network interface. So the two network interfaces actually represent the connection at these IP addresses. That's my back end pool is the two virtual machines. If I click on the health probes panel, you can see that this load balancer is going to do health probes on the TCP port 443, or the HTTPS port. And what's happening there is the load balancer is going to send out GET requests to both of these virtual machines, to each of these virtual machines that are behind it. And it basically is looking for those virtual machines to respond with a 200 OK response to every single one of these probes. As long as each machine continues to respond with 200 OK every single time that the load balancer sends out one of these probes, then that machine will stay online as far as the load balancer is concerned, and the load balancer will continue to serve uh, network traffic to it. As soon as the machine fails two or three of these health probes, it either takes too long to respond or it doesn't respond with a 200 OK, the load balancer will take that VM offline. It doesn't actually knock the VM off. It just basically says, I'm not going to serve any more traffic to you, VM that isn't responding properly, until you start responding with 200 OKs as part of my probes. So let's suppose, for example, uh, my VM0 needs to go offline. It needs to go offline for a software update. So as that machine restarts, of course, the load balancer is sending out probes consistently. And as that machine is restarting, at some point, it will stop responding to these probes. When that happens, the load balancer says, OK, my VM0 is no longer responding to these health probes, so I'm not going to send it any more live traffic. All the live traffic that are on the load balance ports, those are now actually going to go to my VM1 because it's the responding instance. But it will continue to probe my VM0 for a correct response. And as soon as my VM0 comes back up from its restart and it starts sending back 200 OK requests, then the load balancer will go ahead and start sending it live traffic again. So the probes are consistent. They're going on all the time. The load balancer is looking for a 200 OK response for every one of these probes. As long as each instance continues to respond with 200 OK, it continues to get traffic. As soon as it doesn't, load balancer takes it offline, but continues to probe and waits for it to come back up with 200 OK responses. As soon as that happens, it brings the machine back online for live traffic. OK, now let's take a look at the load balancing rules. In a load balancer, the load balancing rules are the ports that are going to be shared between all the machines that are behind the load balancer. In this case, I've got two machines that are behind the load balancer. So these ports are going to be shared by the two machines for these requests. And you can see right here that I've got four ports set up for this purpose. I've got 
port 21, which is the communication port for an FTP request, that's going to be shared between the two machines. I've also got port 22. That is the active data channel for active FTP connections. That's also going to be load balanced between the two machines. I've got port 443, the HTTPS port. Both machines are going to share that port. And I've got port 80, which is the regular HTTP port. Both machines are going to share that port. In just a moment, I'm going to show you how that works. Just for now, though, there are four ports that are being actually shared between the two machines and that the load balancer is going to judge uh, which machine gets that traffic. And those are ports 21 and 22, which are FTP ports, port 443, which is HTTPS, and port 80, which is regular HTTP. Now I want to take a look at the inbound NAT rules. These are the port forwardings for specific instances behind the load balancer based on port. As you can see here, I've got two different NAT rules for RDP, one for VM0 and one for VM1. And the reason for that is obvious, right? If I try to share the RDP connections, the remote desktop connections between VM1 and VM0, I would never know which virtual machine I'm actually connected to, right? Unless I had some means to do it. I wouldn't have the ability to get directly to the machine via RDP. I'd have to keep connecting until I got the right one. But by using port forwarding, I can make sure that when I make an RDP connection that I intend to be for VM1, I'm going to get VM1. And when I make a RDP request for VM0, I'm going to get VM0. And the way I do that is by port. As you can see here, when I try to connect on port 9001, that's going to connect me to VM0. When I try to connect on 9002, that'll connect me to VM1. Then you can see lower down here, I've got additional FTP ports open for each of these specific VMs. In this case, both have 10 of these ports, and these are passive FTP ports. And the reason for this, I'll show you momentarily in it. But basically what I want to do is I want to say, after I make that initial FTP connection, and the load balancer assigns the request to either VM0 or VM1, I want that machine to actually communicate to actually do its data transfer over one of these 10 ports that are specific to it. So there are 10 ports for VM0 and there are 10 ports for VM1, each of which is a passive FTP port. In the case of VM0, uh, it goes from 2000 to 2009. In the case of VM1, it goes from 3000 to 3009. And again, why that is, I'll show you momentarily. Okay, let me close this. And when we go back here to the dashboard, I want to show you the public IP address that's assigned to this subnet. Specifically, I'm after this DNS name, which I'm going to copy. What I want to show you is that the load balancer is going to determine which of the two VMs, either my VM0 or my VM1, that's going to handle this particular request. I don't know which VM it's going to actually get the request because it's load balanced. So the load balancer is going to figure out which of the two machines should actually get the request. When I come over here to this tab and open up a new one, and when I paste in the DNS name, I'm not sure which machine is going to get it. Let's find out. We're just going to go ahead and hit return. And you can see in this case, it's my VM1 that took the request. Now I can hold down the shift key and hit refresh a couple of times and see if it changes. And there you can see now it's over at my VM0. So the load balancer is figuring out which machine is going to actually handle this request based upon environmental factors within the network at the moment. And I'm going between my VM0 and my VM1. So that's the basis of load balancing. I have two machines that are behind this particular load balancer, both of which are going to respond on port 80. The load balancer figures out based on the environment at the moment, which machine is going to get the request. In my case, it could be either my VM0 or my VM1. And as you saw, we can get either machine depending. Now what I'm going to do is show you situations where you wouldn't necessarily want to share ports and how you go about handling that. Okay, you should see that I've changed gears. I'm now running the FileZilla client for FTP. And the reason for that is I want to show you where load balance ports and NAT forwarded ports make sense in a hybrid solution like this. So, as I described earlier, on the load balancer, one of the ports that are being shared is port 21. And in the FTP world, port 21 is usually the port on which an FTP connection is made between a client and a server. 
in an FTP setup, a passive setup, such as the one I'm about to show you right now, what happens is the communication between the server and the client is set to be port 21. So the server is listening on port 21. When the client connects on port 21, it sends FTP instructions to the server. And what happens is after that connection is made on port 21 in passive FTP, the FTP server responds back to the client with the port number that the FTP server will accept data interchange on. So in this case, Ports 2000 through 2009 are assigned to VM0 and ports 3000 to 3009 are assigned in VM1 as the passive FTP data ports. So when a client makes a connection to VM0, it's going to transmit data to that virtual machine on either port 2000, 2001, 2002, so on and so forth to 2009. And if it connects to VM1, it's going to actually transmit data on port 3000 or 3001 or 3002, etc., etc., up to 3009. So, how does that work with our load balance virtual machines? Well, because port 21 is load balanced between VM0 and VM1, I'm not sure when the client connects to my domain name which virtual machine is actually going to receive that traffic. The load balancer is going to pick to send that traffic either to VM1 or to VM0. But once I actually connect to that VM through the load balance port, the VM's FTP software is going to instruct the client what port it should use to actually send the data. And that port is specific to the VM. So taking it from the top, when the client first makes a request to my domain name, the load balancer is going to receive that traffic on port 21. And it's going to choose to send that traffic either to VM1 or VM0, depending on the environment at the moment. Whichever one of those two virtual machines actually receives that request on port 21, that machine is then going to instruct the client, FileZilla, which port it should use to actually send data back. And whatever port it tells FileZilla to use, that port is going to be specific to that virtual machine. So I was able to load balance the inbound request. The actual connection was load balanced. But the virtual machine itself that received that request is the one that's actually going to get the file. And that's going to allow me to avoid cross-contaminating my request. So for example, if the request was actually if the connection request was actually fielded by VM0, there's no way that VM1 is going to accidentally insert itself in the middle of this because its passive FTP ports are specific to the virtual machine and are not load balanced. I'm going to show you what that looks like right now. Here in my local directory in my documents folder, I have this simple test file named testfile.txt. And up here in the host name, you can see I've got chosen the DNS name for the load balancer and the public IP that I'm going to connect to. So I'm going to go ahead and hit the quick connect button. And over here on the right hand side, when the server actually loads, I'm going to see a text file that tells me the name of the VM that I actually connected to. In VM1, I have a text file in there named myvm1.txt. In VM0, I have a file in there named myvm0.txt. So whichever one of those text files shows up, that's going to tell me the name of the machine that I actually wind up connecting to through this uh, domain name because, again, it's a load balance set. I'm not sure which one the load balancer is going to send me to. Let's hit Quick Connect. And you can see I wound up on my VM0. Now my VM0 has communicated back to me to this program which port it should use to actually send the data traffic. And so that's going to be, because it's v my VM0, that's going to be somewhere between port 2000 and port 2009. That doesn't really matter to me. All I need to know is that FileZilla now knows which port it should use to send the file, and that port is going to be specific to my VM0. So let's go ahead and take this test file and go ahead and upload it. Bingo. As you can see, I remain on my VM0 and the test file is there. So the target machine, which was communicated over a private port of 2000 to 2009, has actually received the file correctly. So that's why you would go ahead and use both load balancing and NAT forwarding in order to actually do a hybrid interchange. In this case, the actual connection of the FTP, I want to load balance because I want both servers to handle FTP requests, but the data channel on which they receive the file, I want that to be specific to the machine so that the file goes only to the machine that's actually handling the request.
That's it for this demo. When you're ready, go ahead, wrap up, and let's move on to the next lesson.